All right, I think we're all connected. So I think it's a good time to begin um, a roundtable discussion on the, and the impacts of the Canadian border travel closure restrictions. Uh, this event is hosted by U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen, and we're joined by special guest, Canadian Consul General Roger Kuzner. Um, we do have five roundtable guests representing different sectors and business associations within New Hampshire. Uh, we mentioned a few of them earlier. We have David Kovar, who is the founder and CEO of URSA, which stands for Unmanned Robotic System Analysis out of Manchester. Uh, Chip Desitels, who is the assistant manager of Premier Coach. They have locations in Milton, Vermont, as well as Warner, New Hampshire. Um, Jim Roach, who is the president and CEO of the New Hampshire Business and Industry Association. That is the New Hampshire Statewide Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Cheryl Reardon, who is the president of the White Mounds Attractions Visitors Bureau. And John Nyan, as well, who is the president of the Hampton Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we do have uh, several members of press as well in this event. Um, and this does show how important this, this discussion is to Granite Staters. Um, for press confirmed, we do have WMUR, the union leader, the New Hampshire Business Review. We have Kathy McCormick from the Associated Press, the Caledonian Record, Salmon Press, the New Hampshire Bulletin, and New Hampshire Public Radio. Uh, as well as, I'm um, sorry, the Portsmouth Herald and Seacoast Online is here with us as well. Um, we won't be taking any press questions during this event, uh, but we can help facil facilitate any follow-up following this event as needed. Um, and just to do a quick run of show, um, we have, this will be a fairly relaxed pace, which is great for this discussion. Um, we'll begin with you as well, Senator Sheen and the Consul General will be able to have a nice discussion Following that, I will introduce our panelists one at a time. There's about five to seven minutes that we have with each panelist. So again, this is not rushed. Each panelist has been asked to keep their opening remarks to about uh, two minutes or so, so that um, we, there is ample time for discussion with each. And if we do start to fall behind at any point, I'll chime in and I'll also give a five minute warning when we get close to wrap up time. Um, and then just another quick point, uh, this is, uh, if you could, please unmute and mute yourself accordingly just so we can prevent any background noise or interruptions. Um, but with that, I think we're, we're good to kick it off and Senator Shaheen, turn the floor to you. Well, thanks very much, Michelle. And I'm pleased that on from my office, we also have Chris Scott, who is the Deputy State Coordinator in New Hampshire and um, Kevin Travellini, who actually works in DC on these issues. And then Chuck Henderson, who represents the North Country and is dealing with a lot of folks who have a great interest in crossing the border into Canada. And then Amy English, who is, um, works on foreign, ish, foreign affairs in my office in Washington. So thank you all for being on and we're here to help answer any follow-up questions that we can. I especially appreciate all of the representatives from New Hampshire business community who are on. Thank you for taking time this morning to talk with us about what is a very important issue and, and really thrilled that the Canadian Consul is here with us from Boston by, um, I, you know, there have been a lot of frustrations with Zoom over the last year, but one of the real advantages is that we can get people together um, from all different parts of the state and the country and we can talk. So there is some advantage to that. And uh, Roger, we're really pleased that you're able to join us this morning. Thanks. You know, I had, I was just saying before some of you, I think, tuned in that I had the opportunity on mo Monday to have dinner at the Canadian Embassy in Washington with the ambassador there, who was very impressive, and with a number of my fellow senators who come from states that border Canada. And of course, one of the topics that was very early on the agenda was the border closure and the impact that that's had on both sides of the border. Um, but, you know, people have still been able to fly from Canada to the United States. It's been much harder for those people who need to cross the border um, by car or truck. And it's been closed for non-essential personnel really since March of 2020, when the COVID outbreak began. I was very pleased to hear Canada announce that they will be reopening the border on August 9th. I don't know why we can't get our um, State Department synced up so that we're opening our border at the same time. Right now, it's not scheduled to open until the 21st of August. But I, I know this has been a huge issue for many of you here on the Zoom this morning. And I'm really interested in hearing some of the challenges that you have faced because it helps as we're trying to 
push the State Department, talk to the administration about getting the border open and looking at how we can better address cross-border traffic and the commerce and all of the essential work that goes on by people on both sides of the border. Obviously, tourism is a very important issue in New Hampshire. I know, Cheryl, you'll talk about that, but it's been one of the areas where we have not been able to get people um, in New Hampshire in the same way that we have in the past. And so that's been a concern. And I'm interested in hearing some of the other concerns you all have and, and what's worked and what hasn't worked. Because obviously, if there are things that have been helpful, if you've been able to get through this period without having a huge impact, sharing that with us is really important too. So we can help others figure out how to address the needs that our businesses and our residents have. So again, thank you all very much for joining this morning. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Roger, to talk a little bit about the Canadian perspective. Uh, thanks very much, Senator. And again, thanks for uh, the invitation to join you here today, putting this call together. And I'm looking forward to the presentations as well. Uh, I think uh, we are very much uh, like-minded uh, in, in most areas. Uh, we, we're all dealing with different realities in uh, the the various regions, but uh, I, I think it's uh, not uh, if, it's, it's when and how. Uh, and uh, I know I, I listened to an interview yesterday on uh, CBC, on our national broadcaster, and uh, Dr. Fauci was, was on and uh, he said, make no mistake that uh, the highest levels of uh, the administration are dealing with this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to try to way, find a way through this. You, you, you had mentioned tourism, just a, a, a quick note that um, uh, we camped at, at Dolly Cop back when uh, I was still traveling with my folks. Uh, that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't yesterday, that was back when the Toronto Maple Leafs won their last Stanley Cup, which was in 67, I think. Uh, yeah, we but, try not to talk about that, Roger. <laughs> but, uh, uh, nonetheless, it, it wasn't Disney World, but we thought Santa's Village and Six Gun City were the next best thing. So uh, uh, when you're from a, a, a small coal mining community like Glace Bay, uh, we thought it was pretty cool. And, and we continue, uh, you, you know, I know that uh, my mother and uh, her two sisters, uh, you know, the, the, the outlet stores uh, in New Hampshire, uh, they were uh, like a, a three woman uh, stimulus package when uh, they would arrive in New Hampshire. So, uh, and uh, we go to Hampton Beach uh, uh, to the casino in Hampton Beach. Uh, we're going again on the uh, on the 14th of August to see Blues Travelers to try to recoup some of my uh, my uh, wayward youth. Um, you make John very happy when you say that. Is that right? Yeah, that's uh, it's a, a great. It, it's just a great iconic spot to uh, to see a show. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the two administrations, uh, I, I think, uh, with the new administration, uh, we were really impressed and maybe, uh, the ambassador had shared this with the Senator, uh, it, during your uh, meal the other night during your meeting. Uh, but two hours after the inauguration, the officials from the white house were in contact with her office and, and the officials around their office. Uh, first bilateral meeting was with, uh, prime minister Trudeau. Um, you know, they, they, they set out a roadmap of issues that they wanted to deal with. Um, the, uh, the COVID issue, uh, border issue, security, the environment, there are a number of uh, different issues that ha have been uh, laid out and, and they weren't one-off meetings. They're meeting every two weeks in order to address these significant issues that impact both countries. And uh, so that, that's something uh, that's a step in the right direction, we believe, uh, that we didn't see the, the past administration had more of a, a spontaneous approach to uh, dealing with issues. Uh, this one here is uh, a little bit more, there, there, there's a little bit more uh, ability to, uh, to, to plan and, and respond. Uh, that would sort of lend you to, you know, th th that would give you some uh, appreciation for just how complex this issue is, um, you know, uh, and with the way that uh, the Delta variant has, uh, you know, just sort of taken off, um, it, you know, it, it's been a, a challenge in many jurisdictions. Uh, 
Um, we're seeing it now in Canada. We haven't really seen uh, so much, but we're seeing it uh, now in Canada. Um, we continue to work toward um, vaccinations. Uh, you know, New England has done so well in, in terms of uh, the entire United States, but New England have really um, hit it out of the park with vaccinations, and you should be very proud of that. Uh, we're, we don't have a domestic supply here in Canada, but, you know, we're catching up. And uh, New Hampshire is at about 60%. Nova Scotia and New Brunswick are at 60% now, fully vaccinated. Uh, so, you know, we look at it a little bit different, certainly, than other provinces, Alberta and, and um, uh, B.C., Manitoba. So, uh, but we understand the importance Um if I could, it'll be a shameless plug, but uh, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll, I'll share this and maybe close with this, that uh, the borders mean so much to us. We're really happy that we're able to uh, uh, get some folks across the border uh, as of August 9th. We have two courses, two golf courses in Western Cape Breton at Cabot Links and Cabot Cliffs. And if there's any uh, golfers on the uh, on the call, they would know these two courses. Um they're ranked in the top 100 in the world. And so we got the, the Warren Buffetts and the Jerry Seinfelds and Jennifer Aniston and Sidney Crosby. These folks come up and they golf uh, these two. They're, they're just building the third course. Um, and it's been such a shot in the arm for the western side of, uh, uh, you know, of our uh, island. Um, the, uh, the tips are usually in Benjamin Franklin's and they're good. You know, we like that. Uh, so, uh, having, uh, you know, tourism is such a, a big component of, uh, what we do and, uh, you know, our, our uh, regional GDP. Uh, so the, the borders mean a great deal to us. Uh, but I'll look forward. I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use your American term and I'll yield my time, uh, back and, uh, and I'll look forward to the panelists. And, and again, uh, Senator, um, I'll, uh, we, we have, uh, I, I have uh, Mark Antoine Dumas on the uh, call with me as well. If there's anything arises out of this, if they could go through your office and if there's specific uh, questions or, or initiatives that uh, we can follow up on, uh, let me, uh, you know, lend my, the, 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 whatever uh, uh, we can do through our office, let me lend that to, uh, to your folks. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate your shameless plug as, you know, um, we have a lot of folks in New Hampshire who spend time in Nova Scotia and uh, Cape Breton is obviously a very popular destination. So we appreciate that. I think most people on the call know that um, the Eastern Canadian premiers and the New England governors have the oldest cross-border compact in United States history. And one of the things I enjoyed the most when I was governor was the opportunity um, once a year when we met um, one year in Canada and one year in the United States, um, we went back and forth because it was a real opportunity to talk about how we could improve trade, how we can improve relations between our two countries. And obviously, we have a friendship that goes back centuries that um, we want to not only continue, but expand on. So thank you very much. And I don't know, Michelle, do we, has somebody volunteered to go first? Do we want to yeah. ask Jim yeah. as sort of the representative of the um, BIA to talk, maybe Jim, you might wanna go first from your perspective about what you're hearing from folks. Sure, thank you, Senator Sheen. Thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. And Mr. Consul General Kuzner, good to see you again. And Michelle, thanks for putting this together. And I see some folks on the call that I know, John Nyan and Cheryl Reardon. So good to see everybody. Um, my membership, it has uh, many companies uh, from manufacturing in it. Uh, we have some tech companies, uh, financial institutions, healthcare providers, law firms. We're the only statewide broad-based business advocate in New Hampshire. Most of BIA's membership has been relatively unaffected, except for those in the uh, hospitality industry. So we have a lot of the premier properties in our membership, the Mountain View Grand, Chris Diego uh, in Whitefield, Town & Country Resort in Gorham, uh, Wentworth and Jackson, the Hanover Inn, uh, uh, some others around the state. And I know that they've been adversely affected by the COVID uh, pandemic and the uh, situation with the borders, uh, the, the border, the U.S. Canadian border. Uh, John and Cheryl and others can speak more directly to that. But I, I do want to point out that I have a, 
son who is a dual citizen. <clears throat> and there's a human element to all of this, which I think um, is important to uh, discuss or at least be aware of. So the last time I saw my son was a year and a half ago, two Christmases ago. Um, and the restrictions on visiting Canada were pretty uh, severe. Um, and so really made it unrealistic to, to try and uh, spend some time with him in Canada. He's um, going to school, but his first year of university was uh, remote. So he's been living in an apartment in Quebec City. His school is located elsewhere in Canada. And, um, and he really struggled. He's a young guy, he just turned 21. And like a lot of young people across the country, he really struggled with the uh, isolation and the inability. Canada was, I think, a lot more uh, rigid uh, in Quebec, uh, more rigid than New Hampshire and many parts of the United States. And he suffered as a result. And I just want to point that out because so much of the strong relationship between our two countries is human interaction. And we've missed that uh, very seriously. Again, uh, John and Cheryl and others on the call can speak to the economic losses, but there's the human element, the interaction, the, the things that make our relationship, the Canadian and United States relationship, really the strongest of, two, of any two countries in the world. So um, just want to make sure that we're aware that beyond the issue of commerce is the issue of um, the, the need for human interaction and how that um, tightens relationships or uh, can fray relationships. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Again, there are a lot of other folks on the call with more expertise than I have about the impact on the hospitality industry. But I, I know that uh, many companies out there, many enterprises are struggling as a result of the pandemic and the border closures and the restrictions on traveling back and forth. So thank you both. Thanks, Jim, for raising that because that's something that has sometimes gotten lost in the conversation. And as, as you know, we have a lot of people in New Hampshire who have homes in Canada, we have people who have relatives there, and it's been really hard. I know the, the most difficult case we had in our office was a man whose mother died in Canada, and mm -hmm. he wanted to go help make arrangements for her funeral, and he would have had to quarantine for five days, couldn't take the time off from work, and those are the kinds of stories that um, are really hard, and they're real personal um, and emotional impacts from this border closure that doesn't get talked about when we talk about the statistics and the data. So thank you for raising that. Um, well, thank you. Cheryl or John, do either of you wanna pick up on some of the impacts to our hospitality industry and our attractions? Cheryl? Sure. Good morning, Senator and um, yeah. Consul General Kuzner. Um, I have the privilege of representing the White Mountains of New Hampshire, including the region's 17 natural and family attractions, over 300 tourism-based businesses, and iconic gems like the Northeast's highest peak, Mount Washington, two national scenic byways, including the Kangamagas Highway, and the 800,000-acre White Mountain National Forest. Our association has been investing, fostering relationships, and educating visitors of Canada since the 70s. We have certainly missed our friends to the north these past 16 months and are somewhat nervous when the borders do finally reopen if they will be as eager to visit as they once were. Of course, due to the pandemic, we have all been encouraged to travel within our national borders, which has helped many drive destinations like ours to begin to recover. As more opportunities for leisure travel overseas becomes available and citizens become more comfortable with it, our region is going to again be very reliant on Canadian visitors. With a budget already reduced from the loss of business and knowing that we will need to substantially increase our past investments in consumer shows, media roundtables, and tour, oper tour operator meetings in Canada to reacquaint them with the region and its recreational offerings, we are a bit concerned on how we'll be able to adapt and fund these initiatives. Um, lastly, um, just to kind of echo on what Jim, Jim had mentioned and the Senator, um, the economic challenges of the border closure is not really our only issue. Um, with Northern New Hampshire's close proximity to the Canadian border, many of our fa area families have not been able to see or hug their families to the north. Um, for a destination that is built and prides itself on fostering family connections and um, human connection for so many generations, this would be probably one of the most important reasons to get that border reopened both ways. <laughs> Thanks very much, Cheryl. John, do you wanna to add to what you're seeing in hospitality? Sure, thank you, Senator. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to be part of the panel. Uh, and, and, and hello to uh, Mr. Council General Kuzner. Um, 
just a, a quick story. Since you gave the golf story, I think I can give a, a just a personal story about Canada. Um, when I was a small child, um, the first time I ever went outside of uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, was up to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I had a sister who was a sister of charity, and their headquarters was in Halifax. And so we vacationed uh, in a beach wagon many summers up to Halifax. So we really loved that area, and it was a beautiful country. Anyways, getting back to business, for many years, as far as I can remember, our friends from Canada have been coming to the seacoast um, and looked at the, uh, the beaches of Hampton all the way up through Portsmouth as their vacation destination. This being the second straight year without this particular group of tourists coming from anywhere for two to four weeks, uh, right around the middle of the summer, it's been devastating for our business community. Uh, my chamber represents uh, over 500 members. 60% of those members are in the hospitality industry. 200 members are along the Hampton Beach Seacoast area. What's con confusing to us down here, if we're reading the res restrictions correctly, is that somebody from Canada can come to the United States via a plane so that they can fly from Montreal to Boston. And all they have to do is show their COVID uh, registration or their, their certificate. What's troubling is that that Canadian tourist that comes via vehicle to the United States and to specifically to New Hampshire can come. Now, an important fact that I, that I think is important, Senator, for you to share with the State Department, an important fact about that statement is that 95% of Canadians that come to New Hampshire drive. They take their vehicles and drive. They don't fly to Boston and rent a car and come back up to New Hampshire. They drive because they enjoy the beauty of the New England uh, area, coming in from Vermont to Maine and into New Hampshire. There's a lot of beauty there. And so they take their vehicles. The New England um, Tourist Center in Montreal, which I work with uh, on a constant basis, they just conducted a survey of 5,000 residents in and around Montreal and asked them that if the borders opened tomorrow, would you travel to New Hampshire? 67% replied back saying, we'd have gas in the car, our bags packed, and we would be heading towards New Hampshire tomorrow. The simple fact. So I, I guess, once again, why wait until the 21st of August? Right now, we're in the peak of visit, uh, visiting Canadians. And to lose this very precious three weeks is critical to us. Knowing that I was going to be on this call today, I did a quick survey uh, of our business community just in Hampton Beach. And, and I can't imagine when you take the entire state and multiply these numbers. But just in uh, Hampton Beach, 20% of revenue is lost in the hospitality industry. 20% is lost because of no Canadian visitors. That represents hundreds and thousands of dollars just in our small gem here in, in, in the Hampton area. So you multiply that across the state. Now we're talking about millions of dollars of economic losses. You know, not trying to be political in, the, in this uh, presentation, but many down here in the Seacoast feel that the administration has to be fair on its policies of who comes in and who comes out of this country. So, you know, New Hampshire has been very proactive with the help of the Senator and, and, and the governor. New Hampshire has been very, very proactive over the last year and a half in keeping our residents and tourists safe. As a matter of fact, the governor opened up the Hampton Beach area last summer for all of our visitors in New England. And we did not have one major outbreak. So we really need our Canadian friends to come back to our beautiful beaches. Um, and we really need them to. So thank you, Senator, for the opportunity. Thank you, John. I, I think we all completely agree with that. And 
hopefully we'll get our State Department to align with Canada on this border opening, because as you point out, the summer will be two thirds over, but at least we'll have the month, most of the month of August. If, if we wait until the 21st, and, and again, because we've been doing this on a month to month basis, um, hopefully it would open the 21st, but there's no guarantee. And so um, it, it would be really important to Hampton Beach, to all to the White Mountain attractions, to the whole state, to be able to have those Canadians visiting us again, and for us to, to be able to cross as well. So David or Chip, I don't know which one of you might like to go next. I'm happy to speak, um, and I very much appreciate the opportunity from both the Senator and Council General. Um, we are coming at this from a slightly different perspective. We are a New Hampshire-based high-tech startup that works primarily with the U.S. Department of Defense, but we also went through a technology accelerator called Creative Destruction Labs out of Canada, and that program was designed to introduce Canadian companies to U.S. companies and U.S. companies to Canadian companies and really encourage cross-border collaboration. There's an enormous amount of high tech, particularly in the machine learning and autonomous vehicle spaces going on in Canada that we are working on leveraging. This sort of work uh, involves two different things that really are affected by a border closing. One is that uh, there's some very complex technical and administrative details having to do with security clearances and complex vehicles that really benefit from being able to sit down with each other over a cup of coffee or a whiteboard or whatever and work through these complex problems. Zoom only gets you so far. And the other aspect is that we're working with autonomous aerial vehicles and autonomous sea vehicles. And there's a Canadian company called Open Ocean Robotics that has this amazing autonomous sea vehicle that we wanna use for helping secure the maritime area around New England and up into Canada. And working with these vehicles requires people to actually physically bring them across the border and sit down together and understand how these systems work before turning them over. These are hundreds of thousand of dollars worth of vehicles. You can't just drop them into UPS or FedEx, or whatever, and trust that the people on the other end will work with them. So we've made it through this time by working with the existing tools, Zoom and things like that. And we are very much looking forward to the border reopening. Our concern from a business viability standpoint is that we don't want the border shutting again should something else happen. And so whatever lessons that we're learning right now about the impact of closing the border, we would like to apply going forward and saying, if something else happens, if there's the next generation of the virus where we have to be more careful about who's crossing over the border, let's look at that in a measured response manner. Let's look at it from a business continuity perspective. And then in closing, we are tied into the hospitality industry as well. There's a lot of conferences that go on where the people from these high-tech industries and the defense department and the government industries and things like that get together. And doing work with either one of the governments really requires sitting down and talking to these people in person. And as was pointed out by one of the other speakers, yeah, you can get on an airplane and go places, but one of the joys of being living in New Hampshire is that we can drive up. We can be right in Canada. We can have these conversations. And if a conversation runs long, we don't have to go run for the airport to get on a plane. We can keep having those conversations. So very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to live in New Hampshire and to work in Canada and look forward to seeing where this goes. Well, thanks very much, David. And thank you for pointing out again, as really everybody on this call has done the importance of that person to person contact and the relationships that get built because of that and how important that is to everything that we do on both sides of the border. Chip, shall we, can we ask you to give the final presentation here? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much uh, for including me in uh, today's event. Um, uh, the um, the nature of our business uh, is, is as, as behind me, uh, we operate a fleet of 67 motor coaches. Uh, we operate as both the largest 
uh, motor coach charter carrier in the state of New Hampshire, as well as Vermont. Um, and I can say that the, the Canadian border closure um, definitely impacted our business. Um, obviously, the pandemic, give, being in the business of taking groups of people to group events, uh, it was a real non-starter. <laughs> right. um, um, the, what we do just did not uh, did not work well in any aspect of uh, the pandemic. That being said, um, you know we've lost a couple hundred uh, days worth of of uh, you know bus trips just here in 2021 as a result of the Canadian border closure. Um, I think where my real concern lies, and something that I'm seeing even just very recently is the nature of the group travel business is to plan in a lot of instances very well in advance. Um, so right now, uh, tour operators are looking at trips that may encompass both uh, New England as well as Canada uh, for 2022 and beyond. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty there that's causing them pause in, in scheduling those trips and making the arrangements that are necessary uh, to, to see those trips happen when those days come. Um, even, even with trips that are still, that have managed to still stay on our books, uh, into October, uh, we're seeing cancellations now because of the continued uncertainty about the status of the border. Uh, the tour operators are, are just pulling the plug. They get to a certain point where they, they can't, they can't move forward with the uncertainty of whether or not that trip is going to travel. So, um, even more important, I think, than, than immediately reopening the border from our perspective, at least, is that clarity on uh, the future and uh, that, that we can count on uh, uh, the border being open and, and how that might look uh, for next year and beyond. Uh, aside from that, uh, you know, just one thing that I think back to my driving days when I started with Premier about um, there's a real international uh, experience, uh, honestly, that, that Canada can offer uh, us New Englanders. And uh, it was so meaningful to take so many different school groups uh, up to Quebec and to have them experience and to see the wide eyes as they, they saw and heard things that they'd never been ex exposed to before. Um, th those experiences uh, are, are essential. Uh, for our students and, and something that I really, really hope that we can see return uh, come the school travel season, April through June of 2022. So happy to take any questions that anybody uh, might have. And uh, again, greatly appreciate uh, inclusion today. Well, thanks very much, Chip. And I appreciate the uncertainty issue that you raised because for me and I think for a lot of people, one of the hardest things about COVID has been the uncertainty of what's going to happen. And certainly from a business perspective, uncertainty is one of the, the biggest problems for business because you can't plan, you, you can't figure out how to deal with future revenues coming in and it creates a real challenge. So you're, you really identified one of the problems. Roger, I don't know if you would like to respond to anything anyone has said. Um, you're on mute. I saw somebody in the airport when I was coming down who had a great t-shirt that said, you're on mute. <laughs> anyway, hopefully, hopefully I felt you would think after 18 months you'd catch on to that. I but, know. Uh, anyway. Um, I, I, I used to coach kids for a living, and uh, uh, Ken Hitchcock, who's a good friend, he said, uh, you know, it's like coaching kids, you tell them a thousand times and they catch on right away. And uh, uh, my, uh, my, my skills with, the, with uh, Zoom are pretty much the same. You tell me a thousand times, I'll catch on eventually. Um, let, let, let me make uh, a, a couple of uh, comments first. Uh, and... Um, you know, Canada's, we were more rigid with uh, the our rules around COVID, uh, in, you know, in, in light of the outbreak. Uh, you look at uh, a state the size of New Hampshire with 1.3, 1.4 million uh, residents, uh, my home province of Nova Scotia and our uh, neighbor, New Brunswick, we would have about 1.7 million between the uh, between the, uh, the the two provinces, 
and uh, so a little bit larger population. But but uh, there would be a hundred thousand cases in New Hampshire. We had about eighty three hundred cases between our two provinces, so it was significantly different. There were about fourteen hundred to fifteen hundred deaths in New Hampshire. Um, we had. I'm thinking 130 to 140 deaths in, in uh, between our two provinces. So uh, I, I think probably as Canadians are a little bit more compliant and uh, probably a little more docile. When we see a sign that says stay off the lawn, we typically stay off the lawn. Um, but, uh, you know, and again, I think we're, we're uh, closing the gap on, on the vaccination. And, and so we're, we're going to be in, in, in decent shape, but um uh, the um, Dave's comment about the rules and um, you know ha having some surety, I would think because it, it sort of strikes me. I, I don't want to poke my nose into um, uh, U.S. domestic uh, policy, but um, you know the difference yeah, between poke. <laughs> the difference between flying in and driving in. I, I, I'm not sure what the difference is, and I haven't. I tried to source out, you know, what, what the difference is, and I, I haven't been able to, uh, to uh, uh, identify that. But Dave's point about th there's a, obviously um, a cautionary approach on the part of the administration where they don't want to make a rule and then have to swing back and close it. And we look at Sydney, Australia, uh, you know, where they really took a lot of the uh, rules and regulations off. And then with the... Uh, increase in the number of cases uh, uh, because of the variants, they're having to put those restraints back on and it's not being well received. And we're seeing that, you know, the, the uh, violence in the streets and, and, and the pushback in the streets. So uh, I think Dave's, uh, Dave's point is, um, is well taken. Um, but uh, again, know that we're not in lockstep with the U.S., but there is a, a constant and consistent sharing of information. It's on its top of the mind awareness with all those that are having those discussions. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully we're getting we're, we're getting uh, closer to uh, to an answer and to a resolution. Uh, and certainly Canada understands the. Uh, uh, the impacts we were, we were talking a little bit earlier about some of the uh, provisions around the you know the uh, the buy America the uh, the, the buy America uh, executive order and you know I mean it politically it absolutely makes sense Jesus you know if you're going to be spending this money you want Americans to to, to benefit but uh, a lot of the times um, we are so integrated we are so close. Uh, you know, as neighbors, but we're business partners where we rely on each other. As Dave said, we're back and forth that like that's that's commonplace. And um, so some of those impacts will, you know, they'll be felt by businesses um, in, the, in the United States as well. So we, we have to watch watch for that. Um, again, uh, you know, we'll look forward to continuing to. Uh, uh, to work on a resolution and uh, hopefully we can be part of something positive. Uh, but uh, I very much appreciate the interventions that were made today, Senator. And uh, I appreciate uh, you taking the opportunity and the invitation to, to be here and listen to the, uh, the stories that are being told. I, I know, what, you know, for a fact, uh, the Quebecers that go to uh, old orchard beach every year aren't flying in, Oh, you know, that's rubber tire traffic. And, uh, you're not getting heads in beds, uh, you know, coming off flights alone. They, right. the, 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 it's, it's cars and buses and uh, vehicles that are moving across the border that uh, we have to find a way to get that going again. Well, thank you for that. And um, you raised the Buy America issue. And I have to say that came up on Monday when we were at the Canadian embassy and we all acknowledge that that's something we've got to look carefully at because we want to we want to do it in a way that benefits the United States, but because our economies are very integrated, that we don't want to do it in a way that hurts American companies because we have those restrictions, or that has an impact in Canada, where where we we cooperate so well. So I do think that's an area where we've got to be thoughtful about how we implement in those provisions. 
J- um, if I could, j- just a quick, uh, quick note. Yep. And I know Jim has heard me tell this, this story before, uh, using the example of the uh, auto sector. And they say that a, a part that's uh, made in the United States uh, will cross, uh, you know, go across the border to Canada or Mexico to be added to or added into another part. And uh, if they, they refer to it as an industrial tourist. And if that tourist goes across the border and buys a bad T-shirt, like most T-shirt, like uh, most tourists do, uh, by the time that car arrives on the showroom floor, uh, it's got eight bad T-shirts because the, the parts, or you know, the car or parts of that car have crossed that border that many times. That's how closely integrated we are. So really, the auto sector—it's the North American auto sector versus the Asian versus the European auto sector. And, and, and so I guess, you know, the, 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 you know, when we're having complications with the border, uh, I spend the uh, both governments on how they've been able to keep goods flowing through the course of this pandemic. But, um, you know, the border is so essential and uh, in, in commerce and in industry, I think it's important that we, uh, we make sure that there are no, um, unexpected or unwanted uh, uh, outcomes from, uh, you know, from an initiative like that. Absolutely. John. John. <laughs> Senator, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to get this in before Michelle raises her hand, because I know how strict she is in terms of managing your time. So I, I guess the question that I have, Senator, and, and by your presence today and your, your words today, I, I, I know that you support what we're saying to you today. So my question would be to you is, today is the 31st of of July. How do we move the State Department um, closer to a a, a date? And and what can we do to help you and other New England senators to make this happen? We're willing to do anything that you think would be uh, to the advantage of us uh, inviting our Canadian friends down. Um, I'm going to ask Amy if she would respond to that a little bit because she had a recent meeting with officials at the State Department. Um, Amy, can you share what you heard and um, maybe we could brainstorm a little bit about what might be helpful. I I have tried to use every hearing that had any relevance to um, Canada and our relationship as an opportunity to raise this question about when are we going to open the border, um, the impact on people in New Hampshire and in the entire country. But I know that Amy had um, a meeting that might have some information that's helpful as we think about what else we can do to get attention to the issue. Yeah, thanks, Senator Shaheen. And, and, and just echoing you know, what Senator Shaheen said, that at every opportunity that we have in public and private settings to, to share our concerns on the, on the implications for New Hampshire, uh, constituents, but then also more broadly to our Canadian allies, you know, and friends, we definitely do so. Um, we had a great uh, meeting with the Canadian Embassy a couple of weeks ago, and they've been keeping us in, in great uh, touch on uh, with regards to what they're doing on their end. Um, and we did hope to have a State Department representative on the on the call today, but unfortunately, the schedules didn't align. But uh, they did actually express their interest, at, at, you know, an, an offer to maybe um, host an upcoming. Uh, or participate in an upcoming briefing or conversation um, with Senator Shaheen's office, which might be a good idea. Um, the other area that we could also look to do is engage with the Department for Homeland Security, as this is a State Department issue, obviously, but this is also a border um, issue too. And I know that Kevin has been in lockstep with them too. But I mean, I, I think I think for me, and, and this is what our, our New Hampshire office does so well, um, but continue to feed us, um, um, you know, uh, your anecdotes and and the real life situations that you're facing that help us humanize, you know, the real implications of this continued border closure is really helpful. But I think to the point that has been repeatedly raised here is that it's really, really difficult to plan when you don't know what's coming next. And we all know that this is a, there is a Delta variant that is making it very, very difficult for for us to to do that. But um, I think that there's more that we can hope for this administration to do to manage expectations accordingly um, and to keep um, the communication as clear cut and and, um, and 
uh, thorough as possible. So there is no ambiguity, no citizens get caught on either side of the border. Everyone knows, you know, you know what is either coming or what the current situation is. So I would say next steps um, and Senator Shaheen, I'm happy to um, follow up on this uh, if this is something of interest to see if we could do a follow up briefing perhaps with State Department and perhaps a representative from DHS too, so that we can just make sure that we um, give an opportunity for people to air their concerns and, and ask any questions that may be uh, on the top of their minds. Um, what do you think? Would that be helpful if we were able to set up that kind of a briefing and make it available to um, folks in New Hampshire? Um, let us try and do that. Kevin, do you have anything to add on Homeland Security and what you've heard from them? No, I would just <clears throat> echo Amy's comments. We've been in close communication with both uh, DHS and the State Department throughout this process. I think I would say as well, a lot of this is being led as an interagency effort from the White House. So um, we've been in communication with the White House too, given the different agencies involved. Um, I think to speak to Amy's last point, you know, clarity in, in regulations and uh, in next steps, I think has been particularly important. We saw recently where, you know, Canada announced that on August, 9th, on August 9th, they would allow fully vaccinated travelers. And then we got regulations from the Department of Homeland Security that said on August 21st, the United States would consider allowing fully vaccinated tra travelers. So uh, that's something that we continue to stress with the White House. And I think is going to be important going forward for businesses to make clear as well. Well, let's let us follow up on that suggestion because I think that's a really good one, and it would certainly um, give everybody, all the decision makers here, a real clear idea of what the impacts are, and maybe we can get somebody from the White House on as well. So we will to follow up with that. Absolutely, we will definitely do that and and share that with everybody. Any other I should final? just add, sorry, Senator, I should just add, you know, the Canadian Embassy has been so helpful in, in, in making themselves so available to help New Hampshire constituents that are struggling in getting across the border for, for urgent reasons. And, and just want to say it, um, to the Consul General here that it's really appreciated to know that we have um, such a great ally to be able to help those that are really in, 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 in urgent situations to get the, the support that they need urgently to get across the border. So many thanks to you and your team. Thank you. Any other final comments anyone wants to make before we close out today? I know we promised we would try and get you all off um, in a reasonable amount of time. Just thank you for your leadership on this issue and uh, Council General Kuzner too, you as well. Well, thank you. Um, I think the suggestion to let's see if we can get a briefing so people can hear directly what the impacts are and see if that helps make a difference is a really important one. And we will try and we will work on that um, right now and see if we can't get something set up in the next um, week or so. So thank you all very much again. Um, let's, hope, let's hope the summer continues to do some good work despite the weather and all the other challenges. And uh, let's hope people continue to get vaccinated because that's the ultimate answer to this challenge. We got to get people vaccinated in the United States, in Canada, and all over the world, because as we know, we're in a global environment these days, and we can't just put up our borders and think that's going to keep everybody safe. So again, thank you all for your great work. And please, if you have any questions as a follow-up that um, we can help you with, you know, um, the folks on the call, I should have introduced Robert Henson, who's our business person in Washington, too, who can help. So just let us know. And again, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you.